We know what it's like for complex truths to be oversimplified, to the point that they can no longer be called truths, but rather mistruths. This is commonplace, especially in conversations about the Bible, and particularly in conversations about the Old Testament of the Bible. Join us for a four-week study in May, examining and setting right four lies or mistruths many of us have heard about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is irrelevant. David wrote all of the Psalms. The Old Testament God is angry and violent. And everything in the Old Testament is really about Jesus. So Mikkel, when Jana was little, she's my wife, she and her family would be driving along and her parents would tell her, shh, be really quiet and you might see a deer. <laughs> uh, it, it didn't take Jana that long to figure out that when you are riding along in the car, wildlife cannot tell whether you are being quiet as a child or whether you're being loud. It and cannot. maybe her parents just wanted her to be quiet yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for a little while. Uh, but you can imagine if Jana hadn't figured that out, how funny it would be as an adult right. if you're driving along and you think, I want to see wildlife, I better be quiet inside <laughs> my car. Yeah. Have you ever had anything like that where, where like from a child you <sighs> believe something that maybe wasn't totally true? Yes, I, I have. I, it took me a little bit to think of a good story for this, but when I was a kid, I had two older sisters. I also have a younger brother and uh, my two older sisters managed to convince me that I was adopted. Oh. Um, okay. because my other siblings have photo albums from when they were born, but I was born by C-section, so there's no photo album. And so they used that to convince me that I must have come from someplace else, like I was adopted. And this yeah. is particularly laughable when you consider like how much we looked alike. This is me over here. On the oh, side. yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, um... Looking just like two I of your siblings. I look exactly like two of my siblings. And, uh, but logic, you know, when you're that age, doesn't account for much. And um, thankfully, I figured it out eventually, but my sisters still like to laugh at me about that. It's so easy <laughs> to stretch the truth, right? Because, yeah. you know, legitimately, there weren't pictures of your birth. Right. Legitimately, often, if you want to see wildlife, it's helpful to be still and quiet. Yep. <laughs> But then as a kid, you can very easily take those things and turn them into yeah. mistruths. Yeah. And we've been wrestling with that question of truth and mm -hmm. mistruth during this series. We're in a series called Lies My Preacher Told Me. It's based on a book by the same name from Brent Strawn. And a truth for all of us that we've come to realize is that the Bible is a big and complex book. It is really big and complex, mm -hmm. and it's so easy for us to make mistakes when it comes to the large and complicated subject of the Bible. And the, the reason that's important is mistruths and our mistakes about the Bible, they matter. Yeah. It, maybe we're not talking in this series about full on lying with an intent to deceive, but the truth matters. And at Sycamore Creek Church, we really want to be a community that seeks and cares about truth. Mm -hmm. and, and we care about that because we live out what we believe. Yeah. And we don't want to live out mistruths. So, Mikkel, you're not adopted. That's a mistruth. <laughs> and deer can't tell if you're right. quiet or not when you're driving in your right. car. Yeah, so, you know, maybe a more, like, accurate title but less catchy title for this series is that we're really talking about mistruths that my preacher or my parents or my Sunday school teacher told me. And these mistruths are the result of being ill-informed or just maybe not fully informed. And that happens, like, you know, in lots of different areas of life. It's, it's not always lying per se, but we feel compelled to speak about all sorts of things right. that we don't know the whole truth about. The parents do it, teachers do it, preachers, Sunday mm -hmm. school teachers, our siblings right. <laughs> like to do that and pull our leg a bit. We all do this at times. Yeah. And as we've acknowledged throughout the series, uh, one of the largest and most difficult parts of the Bible is the Old Testament. So each week in the series, we've looked at a different mistruth that most of us believe, and sometimes we'd rather not admit that we believe it, 
about the Old Testament. And then we've, we've reoriented ourselves toward the truth. Yes. And the truth of the Old Testament, it can be tritty, pretty tricky. It's really tricky. To <laughs> grab onto. It takes a lot of time and study. And so let's take a moment just to reflect on where we're all at in this journey of understanding the Old Testament. So we're going to take a minute to chat about this. On a scale of one, which has never read it, to 10, which is expert, where are you with engaging the Old Testament? And why did you give yourself that rating? So today we're on our final lie or mistruth, which is that everything in the Old Testament is really all about Jesus. And this one is particularly tricky. Really uh, tricky. I think we've saved the trickiest one for last because most of us are followers of Jesus. We're Christians. And so we probably think, well, everything is about Jesus. Yeah. When I first heard this, I was like, wait, <laughs> right. everything isn't about Jesus. You know, well, I have to admit that I, I love parts of the Old Testament when they point us mm -hmm. to Jesus. And I wrestled a bit when I first saw this on the list of mistruths that we'd be addressing in this series. Yeah. I, I mean, I totally get that. I think a lot of us did. I And when we're challenged with a new perspective, I think it's always really helpful to go back and ask ourselves, okay, well, why do I believe this? Why do I believe that everything is really all about Jesus? And we can probably trace this back to some preacher or Sunday school teacher who told it to us, who heard it from someone else, who heard it from someone else. And the sentiment that everything is about Jesus, it actually can be traced all the way back to the New Testament. Okay, I'm tracking. This is a good idea, I think, to mm -hmm. kind of go back and, well, why, we, why might we think this? So let's start with the New Testament. Oh, you know, I think one of the famous passages that addresses this idea that everything is about Jesus is found in Luke 24. Yeah. And in Luke 24, we have the story of two disciples who are on their way on the road to Emmaus after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And I say after the crucifixion and the resurrection, but these two disciples don't totally buy that mm -hmm. Jesus is actually raised from the dead. And as they're walking along, these two travelers are joined by a third traveler who we're told is Jesus, but they don't recognize Jesus. And Jesus, always up for a teaching moment, begins walking with these guys and asking them what's yeah. going on. And they can't believe that Jesus hasn't yet heard about the crucifixion. <laughs> That's his own right. crucifixion. And they report to him what the women have said about the resurrection. Yeah. So Jesus is listening to them. He's kind of letting them go on for a little bit. And then he interrupts them. He says, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The things concerning himself. So again, I'm, I'm tracking with this. And the key here is clearly that last verse where Jesus explained from all the scriptures, that would be the Old Testament, mm -hmm. the things concerning himself. And that raises the question, Mikhail, like, doesn't this prove that when it comes to the Old Testament, everything is about Jesus? <laughs> well, I think, I think we should pump the brakes here <laughs> okay, a little bit, fine. like exercise some caution. Because one of the things that's happening in this story is the way that Jesus talks about the Old Testament. Like we can see how much Jesus valued the Old Testament, even in his conversation with the two disciples. So if the mistruth is that everything is about Jesus, the truth is the Old Testament remains vital, indispensable, and irreplaceable. So the Old Testament is really important. Jesus thought it was really important. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Uh, Brent Strong gave another example of the importance of the Old Testament from another place in Luke's gospel. And Again, he uses this to illustrate that the Old Testament is really important and the New Testament mm -hmm. views it that way. Jesus himself does. And in this pla other place in Luke, Jesus is telling a parable. And it's a parable about a rich man and a man named Lazarus. And after their deaths, Lazarus is in glory, whatever that means. And Abraham, this rich man, and so Lazarus is in glory with Abraham. And then you have this rich man on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And this rich man is on the other side of this great chasm. And since the rich man was rich, he's got a bit of entitlement. Um, he's used to getting what he right. wants. And he wants this 
poor beggar Lazarus on the other side of the chasm to come and take care of him with a cool drink. And it seems, you know, the rich man has ended up on the hot side of the chasm. Yeah, so Abraham steps in, intervenes and says, like, that's not happening. And so the rich man tries a different tack. He, he moves in a different direction. He asks Lazarus to warn his family, his living family, so they don't end up where he is in this place, which appears to be the hot, hot side, side of the chasm. That is. So Abraham's response to Jesus' story is really interesting. In mm -hmm. Jesus' story, Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead does come to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham then said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Yeah. Again, the key verse is that last one about the necessity of listening to Moses and the prophets. What Jesus is saying here is that Moses and the prophets are sufficient to avoid the hot place on the wrong side of the chasm. And Jesus tells his listeners, if you don't listen to Moses and the prophets, well, not even someone raised from the dead could change their minds. And that's a really significant detail yeah. that Luke includes there because in all of Luke's gospel, the only person who was ever raised from the dead is Jesus. Yep. And so the conclusion of this parable is that the Old Testament remains vital and dispensable and irreplaceable. And if someone won't listen to the Old Testament, not even the resurrection of a dead person can change their minds. That's, yeah, pretty compelling. So mm -hmm. where does this leave us with everything in the Old Testament being about Jesus? So we've been tracing what we believe and why we want to believe that everything is about Jesus. And the truth is that it is confusing. There's a little bit of a stalemate here when it comes to reading the New Testament. Some places in the New Testament seem to suggest that the Old Testament is complete and enough. But there are other places that seem to suggest the Old Testament isn't sufficient by itself, but that its meaning is dependent on how it relates to and points to Jesus. Okay, so I, I think I get what we're saying here. And if I were to summarize where we're going, it'd probably be most accurate to say that what everything is about for Christians must include Jesus. But that what everything is about is more than Jesus, even for Christians. Yeah, I think that's worth repeating. So what everything is about for Christians must include Jesus. But what everything is about is more than Jesus, even for Christians. So everything being about Jesus is too restrictive. We need everything to include more than Jesus. I'm like, I love Jesus. Me too. Right? Like Jesus is super important. Definitely. And Jesus himself talks about being one with the father, with his father. He prays to God that his disciples may be one as we are one and that the disciples might be in us. Just as he's saying, you father are in me and I am in you. So what these passages and others point to is that the Old Testament's relationship to God need not and should not be restricted to Jesus alone. Ooh. Yeah. So okay. at the very least, we should view how the Old Testament points us toward this person of God whom Jesus calls Father. Because this Father is the God who created the world, who saved Israel from Egypt, who gave us the law. But, you know, I think maybe while we're at it, it might be a good idea to throw the Holy Spirit in here yeah. too. And where this leads us is that maybe instead of just reading the Old Testament through the lens where everything in the Old Testament points us to Jesus, we should be reading the Old Testament with a Trinitarian mm. lens. One that takes into account God the Parent, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yeah. In Christianity, we believe there's a Trinity. It's one God in three persons. The three are one. And the one is also three. And so an overemphasis or a focus on just one member of the Trinity at the expense of the others, it's not just a bad idea. It's actually a heresy. Oh, we use the heresy word. Yeah. There. I mean, there's a bad are, idea. Don't right, do it. Don't do it. There are three members of the Trinity. We can't single out one and forget the other two. Yeah. So to be clear, everything about Jesus is a mistruth because the Trinity, God, mm -hmm. God's self is more than just Jesus. So maybe a better way to put this is that the truth is that everything in the Old Testament is about the triune God. Mm -hmm. So 
let's take a moment and reflect on this idea uh, before we begin to explore it further. You can write your answer in the chat question. Here's our next question for discussion. What do you think of the idea that everything in the Old Testament is about the triune God? Do you agree or you disagree? Why? Let's take a moment and discuss that. I like this truth. Me too. Everything is about the triune God. It's more accurate, I think, for at least two reasons. And the first one is this. Much of the Old Testament is not about Jesus. At least most of the, much of the Old Testament is not obviously about Jesus. And I hope we all realize that, but maybe it would be helpful at this point to yeah. look at an example of something that's not obviously about Jesus. So in Genesis 3, after the man and the woman have sinned, God cursed the serpent to a life of crawling around in the dust, adding in Genesis, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, is that verse about Jesus? No, not really, at least not within the immediate literary context of Genesis. Right. But that hasn't stopped people from believing so, it hasn't. from thinking so, from teaching it. It is possible to read more into this verse than its immediate literary context. And when we do that, we see a sort of proto-gospel or a first gospel. We can find this to be a place that's pointing to the good news of Jesus. Um, viewed through the gospel, we can see where the serpent is more than just a snake. Mm -hmm. Maybe the serpent is the devil himself, the offspring of Eve. I mean, note that it's a singular, singular. offspring mm -hmm. is ultimately Jesus. So Jesus and the devil are at odds with one another. The devil strikes at Jesus' heel in the crucifixion. Jesus crushes the devil's head by defeating death and hell. Viewed this way, Genesis 3.15 can be viewed as a messianic prophecy. It's pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, and what he would one day do for us. So in that verse, we have an example of a place in the Old Testament where it's maybe not originally about Jesus, but if we stretch it just a mm -hmm. little bit, we can get it to work for Jesus. And while we had to stretch a little bit for this verse, there are lots of places throughout the Old Testament oh. where we can break the scripture by trying to stretch it to have it point to Jesus. Yeah, or we just make it nonsensical. It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense anymore when we try to connect it somehow to Jesus. Which brings us to our second reason for why everything is really about the triune God. And that's if we all we care about in the Old Testament are messianic prophecies, we're not putting it to good use. So viewing Genesis 3.15 as a messianic prophecy isn't necessarily wrong. It can be all right, yeah. But it isn't completely obvious either. And it's not obvious at all unless you already know about Jesus. So to see Jesus in that scripture, you have to live like on the other side of the New Testament and already believe that Jesus was more than a first century Jew from Nazareth. This is a great more point, Mikkel. The only way you're going to view Genesis 3.15 as something that points us to Jesus is if you already believe that mm -hmm. Jesus is the incarnate Son of God the second member of the eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Right. <laughs> you have to believe in the triune God. Right, which brings us back to the Trinity. Christian theology isn't just a theology about Christ. It's fundamentally a Trinitarian theology, which requires a larger perspective of God that's not focused solely on Jesus. Mm -hmm. So again, our second reason for everything really being about the triune God is if all we care about in the Old Testament are messianic prophecies, then we're not putting it to good use. So we don't put the Old Testament to use if we good use, we just focus on Jesus because there's a lot more to the Old Testament than just messianic prophecies. Mm -hmm. So according to New Testament or Old Testament scholars, there are as many as 39 different places in the Old Testament wow. that point us toward Jesus. And that might sound like a lot, mm -hmm. and it is, but it's also an average of one messianic prophecy per book of the old testament yeah and not all of them map right onto the new testament and its portrayal of jesus and his messiahship so there are huge swaths of the old testament that we shouldn't just ignore because they don't obviously point to jesus 
Right. And even the Old Testament texts that are taken up in the New Testament and applied to Jesus, those texts still have significance in their original context. They, do. they have an original meaning that's also important that we should consider. So again, we, we might be able to imagine parts of the Bible that are like that, but let's look at a specific example yeah. to help illustrate this. There's an Emmanuel, a God with us prophecy in Isaiah 7 verse 14. And we love to read this passage at Christmas because right. it's found in Matthew. <laughs> it points us toward Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Matthew writes in his gospel, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. Yeah. So the original Old Testament verse in Isaiah, it's part of this larger unit where God is assuring King Ahaz that the kings at his door who are threatening Israel will not succeed. Ahaz was scared right then in his present day. He was. And this assurance from Isaiah, it falls flat. It rings hollow if Isaiah is only talking about Jesus, who wouldn't be born for another seven centuries. You can imagine Isaiah assuring King Ahaz, don't worry about a thing, Ahaz. Everything is going to be great in 700 years. <laughs> 700 years. <laughs> and you can imagine Ahaz saying back to Isaiah, uh, thanks, oh. I guess. But, you know, what do I do about right now? <laughs> right. So what Isaiah wrote had meaning at the time in that context. There was a promise of God's faithfulness to them. And then the added meaning that we can get from it and pointing to Jesus, it doesn't negate or cancel out what Isaiah originally meant at the time. Even though from our perspective now, it can feel really difficult to see anything other than Jesus in that prophecy. So what we're saying here is that the Old Testament is filled with stuff that points to God's care for us, that points to God's faithfulness, and we're operating today with a corrective truth yeah. that the Old Testament remains vital, indispensable, and irreplaceable. So the Old Testament is worth exploring. It's, it's worth getting into because there's way more to the Old Testament than just what points us right. to Jesus. The Old Testament is almost everywhere about God, the, the mm -hmm. triune God, not just Jesus. So as we read the Old Testament, we read the Old Testament looking for all that God is. God is parent, God is son, God is Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's true. We are called Christians, which originally was meant as sort of a dig at followers of Jesus as like little Christ, you know, it's kind of Not a mean. compliment. No, yeah. yeah. But to a certain extent, it's a little bit of a misnomer. As Christians, we don't believe only in Jesus. Christians believe in the triune God. And that means that where one member of the Trinity is present and active, the other two are also. They are. When one acts, the other two are also. Also, the Trinity operates inseparably. So I, I think our main point is then that we find all of God, the whole Trinity in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So it does still kind of, I don't know if we fully answered this question. Is it wrong then to look for verses in the Old Testament that point us toward Jesus? No, no, I don't think so. Like many mistruths, it's just incomplete. It's not the whole story. That makes there, sense. It can't be the only way that we read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is almost everywhere and always about God and almost never explicitly about Jesus Christ. That's a really great point. And mm -hmm. I, let me rephrase that another way just to make sure that we all understand it. Reading the Old Testament as a Christian doesn't require us to see everything as related to Jesus, even though it does allow us mm -hmm to see what's there that's related to Jesus. That's good. Uh, so we don't see every single part of the Old Testament as related to Jesus. It's not all related to Jesus. But because we know Jesus, we're able to see those parts of the Old Testament that do point us to Jesus. Yeah. The, the mistruth we've addressed today about the Old Testament is that everything is about Jesus. So here's our final truth. The Old Testament is not all about Jesus Christ. Even so, the Old Testament is and remains a primary witness to the God that Christians know as triune, parent, son, and Holy Spirit. So in light of that truth, we're, we're wrapping up this series today on lies my preacher told me and looking at the Old Testament. We again want to encourage people to engage the Old Testament, engage the whole of scripture, mm -hmm. uh, read it for what it was for people at that time, read it for what it can be for us today, read it through the lens 
of the Trinity. Yeah. God the Parent, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yeah, let's be a community that pursues truth together in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in what it really means to follow God faithfully together. Amen. Amen. Amen.